Hi everybody. Tonight we're going to talk about activity and exercise. That's chapter 16 in your textbook. We were all brought up with the notion that you should rest in bed when you're sick. Staying in bed will help you get better. However, although rest is important for sick patients, it has negative effects on the body as well. Many patients must stay in bed because of doctor's orders and are therefore at the risks for complications of immobility or complications of bed rest. The truth is the body is supposed to move in order for the person to remain healthy. All the organs of your body depend on movement to function properly. And to steal a line from a popular commercial, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. Nurses play a critical role in preventing the complications of immobility. Psychological and physiological changes can occur as a consequence of immobility. Tonight, we will look at the effects of immobility on each body system. So what are some of the complications of immobility or of disuse? First are blood clots, pneumonia, bun <clears throat> bone demineralization, constipation, pressure ulcers, urinary retention, and depression. Although these are many complications of immobility and prolonged bed rest, these complications are preventable. An important role of the nurse is to ensure that the complications resulting from immobility or disuse can be minimized by maintaining the patient's mobility whenever possible. First, let's talk about the effects immobility has on the bones, joints, and muscles. The muscles. When the voluntary muscles of the body are not used, a person loses muscle strength at an average of 3% per day. Think about that. How much muscle strength would a person lose if they were on bed rest for a week? The impairment of muscle immobility may be permanent. First of all, there's a thing called disuse atrophy. Atrophy means shrinkage, so there becomes a reduction in muscle size, strength, and tone because of prolonged inactivity due to bed rest, casting, or neurological damage. This can lead to loss of endurance and decreased stability, and the person will be at an increased risk for falls. The joints. Decreased joint mobility, or decreased ROM, which means range of motion, joint abnormalities, contractures. Contractures are an abnormal and often permanent flexion and fixation of a joint caused by shortening of muscle fibers. So the muscle, the joints and the muscles that flex your joints, like when you bend your elbow, are much stronger than the ones that contract or lengthen it. So when you don't use it, the joint will go into a state of permanent flexion. One example of this is foot drop, which is known as plantar flexion. When you lace a pine or on your back, the ankle should be flexed 90 degrees so that the toes point toward the ceiling. This is known as dorsiflexion, and that's the normal position that the foot should be in. If your toes fall forward toward the foot of the bed for any extended length of time, the normal dorsiflexion of the ankles is lost. When this happens, the foot goes into the position of plantar flexion. Plantar flexion is a permanent, irreversible condition that we know is foot drop. If you look at the pictures, there's a picture of a contracture. 
and dorsiflexion, which is the normal position of your foot, and plantar flexion. Other changes happen in the bones. The bones become weaker. The person may develop osteoporosis, where calcium leaves the bone and goes into the bloodstream. That results in a higher than normal blood calcium level and what we know is demineralization or decalcification of the bones. When the bones lose calcium, osteoporosis develops. The skeletal bones become weak and very fragile. This leads to an increased risk for skeletal fractures. And the scary thing is that bone demineralization can start and does start two to three days after the onset of immobility. So what do we do about this? The key is prevention. Prevention is activity. One thing that you can do, an important thing, is range of motion, or ROM, moving all the joints. There's two types. There's AROM, or active range of motion, and PROM, or passive range of motion. With AROM, the patient puts his joints through the normal range of motion by himself, and the nurse just directs or supervises. PROM, or passive range of motion, is done when the patient can't do this himself. The nurse does the work. The nurse will put each joint through the normal range of motion, or you may do a combination of both types, active range of motion and passive range of motion. But the point is to do the range of motion and let the patient do the range of motion himself whenever he can. The rest can be done passively by the nurse. The second important thing is to maintain proper body alignment. That means keeping the head, trunk, and hips in a straight line. The joints should be in their functional position, which is slightly flexed. We also use supportive or therapeutic devices that will help maintain the proper body alignment. And then if the patient is allowed to, get them out of bed, ambulate, walk. Of course, you have to have a doctor's order, but ambulation and movement are going to prevent bone calcification, or decalcification, excuse me. <clears throat> then things happen to your heart, the cardiovascular system. There's three major changes. First, orthostatic hypotension. That, you know, is a sudden but temporary drop in your blood pressure when you stand from a lying or a sitting position. Some people, it's much worse than others. It can cause dizziness, fainting, and injury. Second thing that happens is an increased workload for the heart and decreased efficiency of the pumping. This can lead to dependent edema. Dependent meaning the parts of your body that you stand on, which would be swelling of the lower legs. Third, thrombus formation. A thrombus is a clot that attaches to the inner wall of a vein or artery. Bed rest results in a 50% decrease in blood flow to the legs. Blood's going to pool in the lower legs, and we call that venous stasis. A DVT is a deep vein thrombosis. These deep clots can form in the leg and impair the circulation. But even worse, a fragment of this clot may dislodge from the vein and break off where it travels through the bloodstream. As it travels, the veins and the, the blood vessels become smaller and smaller. And the big risk is that this clot is going to become lodged in a small blood vessel of the heart, 
the lungs, or the brain. When this happens, the clot is no longer just a thrombus, it is known as an embolism. And the embolism can block the flow of blood to these vital organs and could result in death. So there could be a pulmonary embolism, a PE, that's an embolism in the lungs. There could be a myocardial infarction, which is known as an MI, myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, where the small vessels in the heart become blocked in the blood clamp pump. Or in the case of the brain, it would be a CVA or a cerebrovascular accident, which we know is a stroke. Interventions to prevent this are, again, increased activity, keep the patient well hydrated, antiembolotic stockings or TEDs, ACE wraps, and venadines, and I'll talk about those a little bit later. If you look on at figure 33-1 on page 729, you'll see a picture of antiembolytic hose or TEDS hose. They're the same thing. They're interchangeable. Antiembolytic hose or thromboepileptic disorder hose, which are TEDS. So the T is thrombo, the E is embo, embolic, and D disorder. They're support hose that compress the veins of the legs to aid the venous return so that it squeezes the veins so that the blood can return to the heart. It's going to help prevent blood pooling in the legs because of an inactivity and bed rest. And that will help prevent deep vein thrombosis. So just to review, an embolism is a clot. A clot is a thrombus. The embolism breaks loose from the clot and travels to another part of the body, the lungs, the heart, or the brain, where it can cause death. Nursing care of TEDS, that's skill 33-1, page 749. We'll practice this when we get back to lab, but just some general points are I'm going to make now. The stockings may be thigh high or they may be knee high. The patient's legs need to be individually measured to assure a proper fit. If you look at the picture on page 750, it'll show the proper method for putting the stockings on a patient. Make sure that the stockings are pulled all the way up and kept smooth and wrinkle free. Do not let the hose fold over or bunch up, especially this can happen at the top. That's going to constrict the venous circulation almost like a tourniquet. So it's important to keep them wrinkle-free and unfolded. Don't let them get bunched. When somebody is wearing antiembolotic stockings, you need to monitor them every two hours to make sure they're smooth and wrinkle-free. Assess the pedal pulse every shift to make sure that there's good arterial blood flow. And remove the stockings or the hose at least two times every day. That's going to stimulate circulation and it relieves any excess pressure. When you assess the patient, assess for edema, redness, how does their skin look, is it intact, and for any pressure. ACE wraps can be used for the same purpose as TEDS, to compress leg veins and aid in venous return to prevent DVTs. Then we have what are known as sequential compression devices, SCDSs. If you read skill 33.2 on page 751, you can learn how to use them. But the other, I usually call them venodynes, 
Venadines are just a brand name. They're the same thing. They come in thigh high and knee high <coughs> lengths. And what you have is a compression device or a sleeve that wraps around the leg and is connected to a compression pump. So the legs then are inside the sleeve. It's hooked to the compression pump. And the pump comes on and off and intermittently compresses the leg to prevent the blood to flow back to the heart. You commonly see these after surgery. People will have them on because they'll be on bed rest for a while. The respiratory system is also affected by immobility. It puts a person at a high risk for respiratory complications. When you're on bed rest, you probably will take shallower breaths, which limits the lung expansion. One thing that happens is the condition known as atelectasis. In fact, that is the most common problem. The bronchioles of your lung, the small tubes, become blocked by secretions, and the alveoli, which is the basic unit at the capillary level, collapse. You can see this actually on a chest x-ray. It can cause fever. You'll hear crackles at the lung bases and a decreased oxygen in the blood when you check the O2 sats. What it is, atelectasis is an airless, collapsed condition of the lungs. So basically, it's a collapsed lung. It occurs because the lungs can't fully expand or the person doesn't take full, deep breaths. Another complication is hypostatic pneumonia. That's inflammation of the lung due to stasis of secretions. Mucus is going to collect in the dependent area or the part of the lung that's lower, and it becomes a breeding ground for bacteria to multiply. And the third complication is a pulmonary embolism, which again is a thrombus that broke loose from the leg traveled to the lung and got stuck in one of the small blood vessels. Interventions, activity, churn, cough, deep breathe, use incentive spirometry. It's, you'll see that in hospitals. It, because when you use the incentive spirometry, you get a measure of how well the person is moving air in and out of their lungs. You want to do incentive spirometry at one hour, at least every one hour, or more often if needed. Turn, cough, and deep breathe. We abbreviate it as TCDB. It's an important intervention. It helps prevent respiratory and circulatory complications. Turning. It's so important to move the patient while they're in bed. Turn them at least every two hours. It stimulates circulation and respiration. It helps prevent blood clots and prevent stasis of fluid in the lungs. Deep breathing. When you teach someone how to deep breathe, instruct them to take a long, slow, deep breath in and hold it for three seconds. Then exhale, so. And let it out slowly. And you should do this five times. Deep breathing expands the lungs and increases the gas exchange, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. Coughing, tell the patient to inhale using long, slow, deep breaths. Hold that for three seconds, then cough forcefully on the third or fourth expiration. Repeat this five times or more. 
And this is also going to help the blood from being stagnant or stasis of fluid in the lung. The incentive spirometry, I wish I had one with me that I could show you. But as the patient inhales into the spirometer, the lungs expand and the ball in the chamber of the incentive spirometer will rise. The better the lung expansion, the higher the ball is going to rise in the chamber. The patient should use this 10 to 20 times per hour. They need to be encouraged to do it. Deep breathing sometimes and coughing and the scent of spirometry are uncomfortable, but they're so, so important. And you can see a picture of one on page 284, figure 16-1. So what happens then to your gastrointestinal system? You would wind up having decreased gastrointestinal motility which results in constipation, fecal impaction, or bowel obstruction. You lose your appetite. You just don't feel hungry or feel like eating. Interventions, you guessed it, increased activity. Get them up, move them around, turn them, have them cough, do range of motion, increase the activity. Monitor bowel movements. Give medication as ordered. In other words, they may need colates to soften their stool or they may need laxatives in order to have bowel movements. Encourage the person to get up for meals, to get up for consults. A nutritionist may be called in for a consult. Know what the person likes and dislikes. They're probably not going to eat as well if you're serving them something they hate. Smaller, more frequent meals help. Between meal supplements and increase the fluid intake. Eight ounces of water every two hours is desirable. In the urinary system, Bed rest and immobility put a person at an increased risk to develop a UTI or urinary tract infection. Just like in the other parts of the body, the urine becomes static. There's no gravity to help the urine go from the kidney to the bladder. And there's also a risk due to poor peri care in the presence of Foley catheters. Renal calculi can develop. A calculi is a stone, a kidney stone. The, and it's the reason it's called calculi, these are kidney stones made out of calcium. So what happens is your kidneys are trying to excrete that extra calcium. Remember all the calcium that came when the bones were demineralized and the calcium rushed into the bloodstream? So now there's a lot of extra calcium there for the kidneys to deal with. Because of all the calcium, maybe they can't get rid of it all as efficiently as possible, and calcium stones develop. As the appetite is decreased, so is the fluid intake. That leads to dehydration and less urine, which will be more concentrated. Intervention, activity, encourage fluid. Use good aseptic technique for peri and catheter care. Offer the person the opportunity to empty their bladder at least every two hours. Bring them to the bathroom if possible or the commode. All of us are more likely to empty our bladder if in a normal position sitting for a female or standing for a male. And by that, I mean sitting on a toilet in the bathroom. Sitting on a bedpan in the bed is not a normal position. But sometimes that's the best you can do because the person can ambulate. The person should be repositioned again. I have already said that, and I'll be keep repeating these things, but they're very, very important. Reposition the person every two hours. Make sure they have adequate nutrition and hydration. 
Look at the bony prominences for redness every two hours in PRN. The next system to be affected by red bed rest is the integumentary system. When a person is on bed rest and pressure is applied to the same area of the body for a continual length of time, blood flow to that area is reduced or maybe even stopped. This leads to skin breakdown. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the skin in another lecture. But important measures are to make sure to reposition the person. You don't want them on the same bony prominence for days at a time or even hours. So reposition at least every two hours. Adequate nutrition and hydration. Look at the bony prominences for redness every two hours and whenever necessary. And then we have special mattresses, sheepskin. There are things that we can do to help with skin breakdown. In the neurological system, there's several complications that can occur. There's going to can be an alteration in your level of consciousness, confusion, brain embolism, or a stroke. And what we call compression neuropathy, the nerves may be compressed in the lower extremities, just like the blood and the skin. And this can result in foot drop. This isn't necessarily due to the position of the foot, but the nerve in the foot causes it in this case. Intervene by providing activity. Assess the neurovital signs and the level of consciousness. Use positioning aids, and we'll talk about that a little later, to keep the feet in dorsiflexion with the toes pointing at the ceiling. Psychologically, there's a lot of things that can go wrong psychologically. Imagine just laying there in a bed day after day. There's nothing to do. There's only so much TV you can look at. You just become depressed, maybe anxious, maybe even hostile, fearful, and you go through sensory deprivation. Like they did studies of people that were in bed rest and intensive care for a long time, and they couldn't even remember the season, the date. They became very, very confused because of being deprived of that. In fact, if your sensory stimulation is so compromised, it can lead to auditory, which are hearing voices, and visual hallucinations. You can minimize sensory deprivation by providing activities to keep the patient distracted and their minds active like the television, radios, computers, magazines, newspapers, puzzles. You can listen and communicate with the patient and encourage visits from friends and family. Although when I make that statement, I'm thinking about the, the COVID restrictions and think about the people that are in the hospital right now. They really can have visitors and friends, though the sensory deprivation is even worse for them. There are certain positions that we use to help people that are immobile when we change their position every two hours. Some patients may need to be repositioned even more frequently. But before we get to the positions, let me talk about some positioning devices that we use to help keep the body in proper alignment. If you look at table 16.4 on page 290, you will see examples in your book. Pillows. We use a lot of pillows when we position people. And that really, really helps to keep their body in the proper alignment. Arm boards, you know arm borne, we use those with IVs. They 
prevent the joint from flexing, and they're often used when the IV catheter is near the wrist or elbow, because if I had an IV here, and I'd be constantly flexing my arm, I could, I could potentially get the IV to malfunction. There's another thing called a blanket roll. That's really just what it says. You roll the blanket, and, and then you place it firmly against the patient's back, or you could use it at their soles of their feet for foot drop. It's often used, the most common time I've seen it used, is to support the back of the patient when the, they're in the lateral or side-lying position. The picture I have in your outline, you need to have x-ray vision to see, but I think you can get the basic idea from it. There's also a thing we call a hand roll that you can place in the palms of the hand to maintain the position of function. Remember that term, position of function. That's the way we want to keep the joints of the body. The position of function is going to help prevent contractures or permanent flexion in the fingers. And that's simple to make. You just fold a washcloth in half and then roll it into a log shape and place it in the person's hand so that their joints and their fingers don't become too tight. There's a foot splint, which could be used to prevent foot drop. Or there's also just a board that you can apply or a bank, blanket roll at the soles of the feet to keep the toes pointed upward at the ceiling in the dorsiflexion position. A trochanter roll is used to prevent external rotation of the legs. You use a blanket roll and place it against the lateral sides of the thigh to prevent the hip and leg from rotating outward. I don't know if you've had um, the muscles and bones yet in science, but the trochanter is the bony process. That's at the upper part of the large bone of the femur, the upper leg bone. Next, I want to talk about common positions in bed. You can see those on table 16.3 on page 289, and also skills 16.2 tells you how to position people. I'm going to briefly talk about it. It's certainly something that you learn better when you do it. So if you've got a lot of pillows or blankets or towels you can roll up, See if you can find someone in your family that's willing to be your patient and try positioning them in these positions. Positioning a bedridden patient properly to prevent the complications of immobility is not as simple as just turning them in that position and walking away. You have to use positioning aids to assure that the body is properly aligned, keeping the head trunk and hips in a straight line. The extremities need to be positioned so that the joints maintain their normal function. Again, this is referred to as placing the extremities in the position of function. Positioning for function is going to help prevent pressure, pain, and damage to the nerves and joints. First position is the supine position. That means you're on your back or supine on the spine. You have a pillow under the head, arms, and knees. You place a pillow under the forearms. Don't put it under the upper arm near the shoulders because that'll pull the shoulder out of its correct body alignment. You can elevate the head of bed slightly for comfort. The prone position means you're on your stomach or abdomen. 
small pillow or a folded towel is placed under the abdomen. That's going to help relieve pressure on the patient's back or their lower back. A pillow under the head and have the head turned slightly to the side. You wouldn't want them face down in the pillow. It just wouldn't be comfortable. You, again, put the pillows under the arms and position the arms at a 90-degree angle with the elbows bent. And then you put a pillow under the lower legs and keep the toes off the bed by positioning so that the feet hang over the edge of the mattress. The prone position is seldom used in uh, facility settings by nurses because it's a very difficult position for a compromised patient to assume. Although I have heard that they're using the prone position more right now to when they're taking care of COVID patients because it's a more comfortable position and relieves some of the pressure on their lungs. A Fowler's position, Fowler's means sitting, and there's three different positions. You can be in semi-fowlers. That's when the head of the bed is elevated 30 to 45 degrees. It's a comfortable position when you're resting or reading and you don't slip down in the bed that way. Fowler's itself, if the head of the bed is elevated higher to a 45 to 60 degree angle, Maybe watch TV or talking to your visitors. And then high fowlers is when your head of the bed is elevated 60 to 90 degrees. So you're basically sitting like I am now. It's easier and safer to eat this way. And when you have respiratory problems, this may be a more comfortable position. Make sure you put a pillow under their head and arms, and you can see that in the picture. They'll also have, they may have a pillow under their knees. I said arms and wrists. Heels off the bed. A footboard works nicely here. Before you put somebody in any position, boost the person up in bed. You know, sometimes people slip down and their feet are pretty much touching the footboard. So you want to first boost them in bed before you turn them or sit them up in bed. Raise the knees only slightly. I usually don't even hardly use that knee thing on the bed because pressure against the back of the knees may restrict, res may restrict circulation to the lower legs. And you know what that would mean if the, the circulation is restricted, the person is at a higher risk for developing DVTs or deep vein thromboses. The lateral position is your side lying position. It could be the left lateral where the person is laying on their left side or it could be the right lateral. The lateral position relieves pressure on the back, sacrum, and coccyx. You want a pillow between the legs and then flex the upper leg. As you see in the pi picture, it's going to prevent pressure on the knees and ankles. A pillow under the head. Kind of gently pull the lower shoulder slightly forward to prevent pressure on the joints and nerves. And then a pillow is folded lengthwise at the back. You tuck the edges of the pillow under the person's back. That keeps the person on their side. So the person may relax and lean backwards a little bit, but the pillow tucked behind him will keep him in the side-lying position. And as you can see, the person has their upper arm on a pillow, and the arm is flexed over the pillow. Again, all of these positions we will practice in lab, but practice them at home too. The lateral oblique 
is the same as the lateral. I don't have a picture of it, except the, the top leg is positioned behind the body to prevent pressure on the trochanter. The Sims position is a modified side-lying position. Left Sims is what you usually see people in. Left Sims is actually an ideal position for giving an enema. If you can't use the Sims position, left lateral would be the position you'd use for an enema. So you turn the patient onto the left side Move the patient so that they are partially lying on their stomach with a pillow under their head and their head turned to the right. There's a pillow under their right arm. And again, this is left Sims. <clears throat> the patient's arm is flexed 90 degree angle at the elbow. There's a pillow under the thigh of the flexed right leg. The left leg rests on the bed with the knee slightly flexed. The left shoulder is slightly pulled back so that it's not under the patient. And you can see a picture of somebody in the Sims position. It's hard to follow with the reading, I know, but if you go through the procedure in your book and hopefully in the video that I'm going to show during this, it will make more sense. The Sims position is also a difficult position for most compromised people to get into, so it is not used that frequently. When you position someone in a chair, the feet should be flat on the floor, the knees flexed, the buttocks firmly against the back of the chair, the spine straight, and also against the back of the chair. And the arm should be supported on armrest. So I'm not even sitting right, but there, assuming I have armrest. That's how you should be in a chair. The next thing I'm going to talk about is moving a patient. An immobile patient is unable to even boost themselves or move themselves up in bed. They can't turn themselves and they can't reposition themselves. A patient can be moved manually by nursing staff or with the aid of lifting equipment. Moving a patient up in bed, which we call a boost, you can see on page 299, skill 16.3, you need two nurses, one on each side of the bed. You have the patient in the supine position, and if the patient can tolerate it, take the pillow out from under their head. It's a lot easier to move on a flat surface as to trying to move them uphill. I mean, I guess you could try sometime to see how much harder it is, but somebody's got their head elevated and it's on a pillow and you try to give them a boost, you're all going to be working too hard. The person probably will have a draw sheet underneath them. Really, a draw sheet is only a regular flat sheet that we fold in half. It's placed under the patient with the folded edges toward the head. It's positioned under the patient at midline, probably from the lower shoulder blade to below the hips. When you're ready to move someone, you untuck the draw sheet. Each nurse is going to roll the draw sheet until it's as close to the side of the patient's body as it can be. The nurse grabs the draw sheet near the shoulders with one hand and with the other hands near the hip. If the patient can assist you, have them bend their knees and place their feet flat on the bed. Instruct that patient to push against the bed on the count of three. That way the patient can assist you 
and take some of the strain of lifting off of the nurses. The nurse on either side stands with her front foot pointed towards the head of the bed. The back foot is planted towards the side of the bed and you have that wide base of support like we talked about when we talked about um, body mechanics way back when we did safety. So you don't have your two legs touching, you wanna make sure you have them at least shoulder length apart. On the count of three, and choose one nurse to be the counter. On the count of three, you're going to lift the patient with the draw sheet, the patient is gonna push with their feet, and you're going to move them toward the head of the bed. Sometimes an incontinence pad, which you've probably seen. Again, I wish I had one with me, but you've seen them in the lab and you will. We usually have them on the beds when we've been getting into bed for the lab procedures. That could be used for a draw sheet to boost a person. The disadvantage is that you don't have as much material to roll and grasp, so it's harder to get a firm grip. Whenever you use a draw sheet or a incontinence pad, it's probably going to go up to the top of the bed with the person. You want to reposition that, have the person roll over, remove that draw sheet, and put it back where it belongs. Turning a patient, that's skill 16.4 and page 300. Determine how much help you're going to need, how many people do you need to help you move this person. First, before you turn somebody on their side, you want to move the patient to the opposite side of the bed. The reason you want to do that is because if you roll them over, from where they are, they may practically be hanging over the edge. You want to turn them, move them to one side so that when you turn them, they're going to be in the center of the bed or as close to it as possible. So what I'm saying is if I'm going to turn somebody onto their left side, first I want to move them to the right side of the bed so that when I turn them, their right side will be in the, their correct side will be in the center. Always we use a count of three. So on the count of three, the patient is turned toward you using the draw sheet. Then you can correctly position the patient in the lateral position with the pillows, or you can turn them on their side for personal care, to reposition the draw sheet, or whatever. Log rolling is another skill. That's on page 301, skill 16.4. We log roll patients if they've had spinal injuries, underwent spinal surgery. Anytime the body has to be turned is one unit. The patient you're going to turn like they're a log. You know how, it, not that I've rolled over many logs, but if you were going to roll a log, it would all roll at once. That's why we call it log rolling. You need three nurses for this. One nurse stands at the patient's head. The nurse at the head is responsible for making sure the head and shoulders stay in alignment. The nurse at the head of the bed is the one that's going to re be responsible for the count. So the head nurse, she's the head nurse. She's responsible, and she, in this case, responsible for the count. Another nurse stands at the patient's waist, and the third nurse stands at the patient's thigh. Nurse two and three are going to ensure that the lower body stays aligned during the turn. Have, instruct the patient to cross their arms across their chest. 
all three co-workers grasp the draw sheet or slide sheet and move the patient toward your side of the bed. The nurse then goes to the opposite side, places a pillow between the patient's legs, and on the count of three, grasping the draw sheet, all three nurses turn the patient towards them with each body part moving at the same time. Then you'd use your pillows and positioning devices to put the person in the position of function. Next thing we're going to talk about is transferring a patient. I don't mean transferring them from room A to room D. I mean by transferring, getting them up, moving them out of bed or to a chair or wheelchair, or maybe moving the patient from the bed to a stretcher. In other words, I could have put it more simply and just said the patient is being transferred from their bed to another place. From the bed to the chair, determine how much help you're going to need. Gather your equipment. This is a transfer or gate belt. Nursing doesn't always remember to use them. You'll see physical therapy using them all the time. But we really should use these. Make sure you have non-skid footwear or slipper socks, a gown, and a robe. Often the robe is a hospital gown put on backwards. You take your chair and position it next to the head of the bed if the patient has one side that's stronger than the other. You want to position it on the strong side. Place the transfer belt around the person's waist. You want to make sure that you put it on snugly. You don't want to cut their circulation off, but you want it to be tight enough so that it, when, it, when you go to lift the person, it's around their waist. If I have this too loose, what's going to happen when you go to lift it, it's going to come right up. Raise the bed, head of the bed to a high fowler's position. That is going to make it easier for you to dangle or move the person to the side. You grasp the transfer belt on either side. There's a picture on page 305. And on the count of three, you move the patient to a sitting position. So you sit them up and pivot them to the side so that they're legs are dangling over the edge. You don't want to immediately stand them up because they may be dizzy or nauseated or it may have created pain. So wait a few moments before you move them. It's a good idea at this point to check their vital signs because remember they may have orthostatic hypotension so you want to have a baseline. You should have the bed in a low position so that the patient's feet can touch the floor. Some beds go so low that they're too low. Some of the ones in um, long-term care facilities, low beds. So you want it low enough so that the person's feet touch the floor. You flex your knees. Grasp the transfer belt on either side of the waist and tell the patient, you can even rock back and forth to get a little momentum, and tell the person on the count of three to stand. Instruct the patient to hold on to your shoulders. Sometimes they'll put their arms around your neck. That's dangerous. It can cause neck and upper back injuries for the nurse. Once they're standing, give them a brief moment to adjust and get their equilibrium. And grasping the gait belt, you help the patient to pivot so that his back is in line with the chair. Tell him to step back.
backwards until he feels the chair against the back of his knees. When he feels the chair against the back of his knees, he should reach down and grasp the arms of the chair, and then you gently lower the person into the chair and position him in the proper sitting position. That, what I just talked about, is moving a person from a bed to a chair with one nurse. You may have needed more help. There may be a two-person transfer. And again, that's something we will practice in lab. If you're assisting the patient to ambulate or walk, Find out how much help you want, you need. Probably it's always a good idea, especially if it's the first time the person's ambulated, to have another person with you. You get them up from the bed, have them dangle on the side and stand just like we talked about before. Then using the gate belt, walk the person down the hall. All the time you're walking them, be assessing them for any shortness of breath, fatigue, dizziness, or pain. If these things occur, they obviously are having an intolerance to ambulating, so it's best they be returned to, <coughs> be returned to bed immediately. What really works well, and what I like to do, and for safety reasons, have another nurse following along with a wheelchair then if the person becomes dizzy or faint, they can sit right in the wheelchair and you can take them back to bed by that and they don't risk falling. If the patient falls, you lower the patient to the floor like we talked about before by sliding him down your leg, making sure that their head is protected and call for help. Don't try to hold the person up. Now, the, there are some aids I talked about then, but let's just review them. There's the draw sheet, which we talked about. They also use a thing called a slide sheet. A slide sheet can be actually manufactured and made of nylon, or you could just use one of those big green garbage bags. The slide sheet's going to help reduce friction. You, it's put under the bedridden patient to help them slide more easily up in bed or to move from the bed to the stretcher. See skills 16.4. A slide board. A slide board is a hard, thin plastic board that's used with a draw sheet or slide sheet. The patient is turned onto the slide board, and then they're moved easily from the bed to the stretcher. If you look on page 292, figure 16.3, you'll see a picture of a slide board. There's another thing that helps with patient movement. It's called an overhead trapeze. It's a triangular bar suspended above the patient. Then the patient, if they have upper body strength and mobility, they can reach up and grab a hold of the trapeze to lift some or all of their weight off of the bed. It assists the nurse and it also makes the patient more independent. Then we have mechanical lifts. Mechanical lifts are used for patients who require significant assistance who cannot get up with a one-person or two-person assist, and they're pretty much total weight on the nurse. There is a machine that brings the person from a sitting to a standing position. The brand name I've seen use is called a Sara Lift. It moves the person from a sitting to a standing position. The person holds on with their hands, so they have to have upper body strength or some strength in their upper extremities to use this. If you look at figure 16.4 on page 293, you'll see a picture of one of those. Then the one you see more often, 
if you work in a hospital or a nursing facility, you've seen the sling type lifts. We usually call them Hoyer lifts. They're not all Hoyer lifts. Hoyer is a brand name, but because it was probably the first one, we identify sling type lifts as Hoyer lifts. I don't think I would ever say get the sling type lift. If I wanted somebody to help me lift somebody, I'd say, can you get the Hoyer lift? The patient is put in the sling, which is attached then to the lift device, and the patient is moved. You'll see that when you get to clinical. There is a picture of one on page 293, figure 16.5. And then in some of the newer facilities, they have overhead ceiling lifts. They work the same way as a Hoyer lift would work, except that the, the, tra the gadget is attached to the ceiling that has the, um, the chains to position the sling. And it's probably safer because you don't have to worry about the weight of the patient and the, making sure that the Hoya lift is in the lock position and the base is widened and all those things that could cause problems. But you don't see them that often because they aren't routinely installed in older facilities. So basically, some guidelines and principles when you do move a patient. Basically, what you want to do is always use good body mechanics. Back injuries are one of the main reasons why nurses' aides and nurses are out of work and maybe never able to work in their profession again. So always use good body mechanics. Elevate the bed to a comfortable working height. Use a wide base of support. When you boost a patient, stand with your front foot toward the head of the bed, the back foot pointed toward the side with a wide base of support. This is going to reduce back strain and injury. Always lift on the count of three. Choose a nurse that's going to control the count. Make sure all the people working with you are ready and aware when the count happens. You can use assistive devices to aid in the lift and help reduce back strain, like trapeze, the draw sheets, slide sheets, slide boards, etc. And lower the side rail next to you when you're providing direct care. It's important, don't try to lift or move somebody that is not able to assist you always get the help you need and if you're having if you can't do it yourself don't try make sure you get somebody else that's why the male nurses and the um, male cnas are very very popular when it's time to boost and move and turn patients because not i hate to admit it but in general men have better upper body strength. Not always, but generally. You want to always maintain patient safety. Raise the side rails when the bed is ra being raised. Keep the side rails raised when the bed is in the high position unless the nurse is positioned directly by the patient's side for patient care. Lower the side rails when the bed is in the low position. And provide the call light when you leave the patient. When you're moving patients, try to lift them. Don't drag them. When you drag a patient, what happens, you get what's called shearing. Shearing means that you move the patient patient in one direction toward the head of the bed and the skin doesn't slide with the rest of the body. So that will cause a, an abrasion or a shearing. It can lead to skin breakdown, pressure injuries. 
There are specialty beds that we can have to put people in when they have a compromised skin condition or compromised skin integrity, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. We'll talk about that when we talk about wound care and skin integrity. You always use positioning devices, pillows, footboards, and such to maintain the person in the position of function. Always turn the patient towards you. The last thing we have in this chapter is range of motion exercises. That's skill 295. I know, excuse me, it's skill 16-1 on page 295. Range of motion exercises should be performed every eight hours to help maintain muscle flexibility and joint flexibility. Remember, they can be active, A-R-O-M, A-R-O-M. That's when the patient can do the exercises for themselves, or they may be passive. Prom, where the nurse performs the range of motion because the patient can't do it themselves. You're going to learn to do range of motion and practice it in lab. So I'm just giving you a basic overview. I'm going to show a video of range of motion that might be better. It's hard to look at those pictures and determine what they're doing. But if you have a, a likely um, patient at your house, a child, a husband, a wife, a girlfriend, whatever, your mother, whatever, to see if they would agree to be your patient, you can practice range of motion. You want to make sure you always support the joint at the, <clears throat> always support the weight of the joint. You don't want to be picking somebody's arm up with one hand and it's dangling all over the place. You want to use both your hands. So one hand should be above the joint and one hand below the joint. So one hand here, another hand here. I need a, another person, but you know what I mean, I hope. <laughs> uh, so again, not just to emphasize that, if I was only using one hand to move my elbow, it's going to flip-flop around like a rag doll. Move each joint to the maximum extent of motion. If you meet resistance to movement, stop. So if you were doing my elbow and all of a sudden it hurt, you couldn't move it anymore and I was grimacing, that's when you'd want to stop. You wouldn't want to push it any further. You never want to force a joint beyond the point of resistance or pain. Before you start range of motion, check the doctor's orders for any ref restrictions. For example, I may have had um, a spinal injury, a cervical injury, and they don't want you to do range of motion on my neck. I may have a broken leg, and you can't do range of motion there, or whatever. So check the doctor's orders. Proceed in an orderly fashion, putting the joints through the range of motion from your head to your toes. So where's your first joint? It's this joint right here in your neck. So you're going to start with your neck. Then you're going to move what's your next joint is your shoulder, right? So you do the shoulder next, then the elbow, and then the hand and fingers. So I wouldn't want to do the shoulder, then go down here to the fingers, then jump around to the neck. So go in an orderly fashion from here to here to here to the lower extremities. So you go neck, shoulder, elbow, wrist, fingers and thumb, hip, knee, ankle, foot, and toes. Do each range of motion exercise five to 10 times. So if I'm doing lifting the arm at the shoulder, I wanna do that five times. 
I just, the next thing I wrote down here are range of motion terminology. Some of this you know, some of this you can look up and get through reading when you read the um, procedure and the skill. You know what extension is and flexion, they're the opposite. So I extend my arm and I flex it. Abduction and adduction. That one I always remember because abducting means to take something away, like you're abducting a child and a kidnapping. As well as I'm abducting my arm, I'm taking it away from my body. And then adducting, I'm adding it to my body. And the rest of them you can read. We already talked about dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And there's a couple of others. I'm going to show the video now, then take a little break, and we'll go on to the second part of the lecture, which is musculoskeletal conditions and immobility, and that's chapter 27.